morning, Catapult. It's so good to be able to worship with you all this morning. Um, right now, let's just take this time to um, open our hearts to worship as we pray. and spiritually, but um, I encourage you to just take this time to speak with God. Um, He knows where you are at, and he sees your heart, he sees you. So let's pray, just opening our hearts to God, asking him, Lord, come. Come, fix my eyes on you, fix my heart on you, that this time would be true and genuine worship to you. this morning, just opening our hearts to you, God. Father, we pray that you would just work powerfully in this time, God, as we worship together. Father, I pray that you would, God, give us this heart of worship, the spirit of worship, Father, where, God, you would remove distractions that tempt us to to fall away from you, God. I pray that you would just bring us here, Lord, to this place of worship, God, where we can see you, Lord, where we can hear you. Father, thank you so much for this time, and in your son's name we pray, amen. Catapult, if you would worship with me. Take and seal it, 
seal it for thy courts above. This next song that we're going to sing might be a new one for some of you, so I just encourage you to um, to sing along with the words, um, to meditate on what this song is saying. It says, hallelujah, Christ is risen from the grave. And that is the greatest news that we could ever hear and receive. For you singing these words, God, declaring that you have risen from the grave, God, that you have made a way 
for us to be called your children. And God, this is the, the greatest news, Father. Father, I pray that you would help all of us to believe this, God, to rejoice in this because, God, this is life. And so, Father, we thank you for this time that we have to be able to worship you, to listen to your word. And, God, I pray that you would work in our hearts, God, that you would transform us, God, to make us more like you, God, to love you more as you deserve. And Father, we thank you. We love you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, you know, I went to Feed Brea yesterday with a handful of you. Uh, and so if I look like a tomato from the sun, I apologize, but uh, that's what happened. And so uh, just kind of power it through. If it bothers you, just, I don't know, look away. Uh, for a lot of us uh, who finally make it to graduation or to a special event, uh, or maybe even for some of us, something like a date, what we try to do when we arrive at these milestone moments is we try to put our best foot forward. We want to do our best to look presentable, especially if there's someone we want to impress who's there. We want to we uh, show uh, the best of ourselves. And so what we'll tend to do is, um, you know, for some of us, we might put on makeup. Uh, we'll clean ourselves up to get rid of all the bodily odors and bodily oils and filth and dirt. We try to clean up ourselves, and, and that's our goal. We, we want to, to get rid of everything that's messy about us, tuck, tuck away everything that's flawed, and, and show the best version of ourselves. And, and it's not just our outer appearance. We also try to clean up, for a lot of us, maybe our posture will start to straighten out We'll clean up our uh, attitudes. Uh, if some of us are maybe more cynical or shy, we'll, we'll try to tuck that away. Uh, we might even kind of clean up our language in the way that we talk. And this is a really normal thing that we try to do because we want to put our best foot forward. We want to get rid of all the messy, all the dirty, all the filthy things and clean ourselves up as much as possible. But why? Why do we do that? It's, it's, it's kind of a weird thing for us to think about. And I think part of the reason, there's a lot of reasons, but I think one main reason is we tend to judge and assess other people by what we see on the outside. So if we see someone walking in or maybe we're meeting someone for the first time or again, and we see that they're very beautiful, that their hair is done well, that they have nice clothes on, uh, they have a charismatic personality, uh, they're very gifted. If we tend to see these things, that, then we get impressed by them. And we're like, wow, this person is awesome. I, I, I like this person. And so when we assess other people, it's really common for us to judge them by what we see on the outside only. But for a lot of us, I think at this point, I think a lot of you, I, I know there's sixth graders all the way up to seniors in here, but a lot of you are old enough to figure out, hey, just because someone looks and appears a certain way on the outside, that doesn't mean who, that's who they are on the inside. Because when they get behind closed doors, then maybe you find out that, man, they're, they're not a really great person after all. They actually kind of, they're, they're pretty mean. They're they're pretty messed up. They're pretty sinful. And we see that in them. And it disappoints us. See, there, there's a writer of a magazine. Uh, she, she writes for uh, Entertainment Weekly. Uh, she also writes for uh, teenage magazines like uh, Elle Girl. I, I don't know if any of you read that. I, I don't personally read that. But uh, her name is Christina Kelly. And uh, on one of her blogs, this is what she writes about celebrity culture and how we kind of interact with uh, these athletes and artists and actors and actresses that we look up to. This is kind of what's happening uh, within us. She writes this. We worship them because we feel inconsequential, 
but doing it makes us feel even worse. We make them stars, but their fame makes us feel insignificant. I am part of this process as an editor. No wonder I feel soiled at the end of the day. There's a strange phenomenon where we, we realize that what we see on the outside isn't everything. There's so much beneath the surface, but we buy into this trend of trying to impress other people with what we show them. And the reason is, what this editor is saying is, it's because we feel inconsequential. For a lot of us, we're deeply insecure. Some of us, we hate ourselves and we feel like we're nothing. And on top of that, there's this guilt, there's this shame, there's this sense of, man, I'm, I'm horrible, I'm terrible, and so I need to cover up. I, I can't show other people all my flaws, all this deep, broken stuff, and so I'm going to, on the outside at least, look presentable enough for people to like me. And this is a massive problem. See, the real problem is we feel terrible about ourselves because we realize just how dirty, how filthy, how messed up, how sinful we are. And the question is, what can we do about that? What can actually cleanse us? What can actually get rid of our insecurities? What can actually, what can, what can cleanse us of our guilt and shame? What can actually get rid of all of these things that we tr truly deeply struggle with? What is the solution? If you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 7. And Jesus is going to be talking about this very thing. What does it mean for us to really be cleansed? And so if you have your Bible, please turn with me there. You know, so far we've been in Mark. And Mark has been this fast-paced story where he's kind of just doing all of this stuff. So Jesus is uh, working miracles, and so he'll heal people, feed these people, uh, walk on water. He's doing all these action items. But here Jesus is actually engaging in a discussion, a, a very heated discussion actually, with some of the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes. And he's going to be talking to them about this very thing, what it means to be clean. And uh, as we look through this passage, we're going to look at two, two ways, uh, two religious ways that those probably inside the church, oftentimes, uh, sadly, two religious ways to deal with this, this uh, feeling of being so dirty and filthy and sinful, uh, these two ways that kind of fall apart. And then lastly, we're going to look at the only way that truly works, the only way that we're actually made clean. And so we're going to start here, Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. We'll have it on the screen somewhere. It'll magically appear somehow. Uh, Mark 7, 1, it says, Now when the Pharisees gathered to him uh, with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw some of his disciples uh, ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? So the Pharisees and the scribes, they're the religious leaders. They come to, to kind of spy on what Jesus and his disciples are doing. When they get there, they see that Jesus' disciples, some of them, before eating, they didn't, they didn't get a chance to wash their hands. Okay, I know we're in 2020 right now, and it's like, Dude, can, can you just like wash your hands? This is like proper protocol. Sing the birthday song or 20 seconds or whatever. But this isn't what the religious leaders are talking about. All right. They're not saying, oh, like you guys are, uh, you should be more hygienic. What is, you know, what's wrong with you? They're, they're not saying that. What they're actually saying is it has nothing to do with general hygiene. What they're talking about is religious purification. See, it, it gives kind of the backstory of what the religious leaders think. It says here that they only they only eat after they wash their hands. In fact, all the Jews do this. 
But the, the interesting thing is there is no verse in the Old Testament that talks about everyone needing to wash their hands. The, the, the only time that, that they have this is there is a very specific group of people that need to do this. It's the priests. But this is what the religious leaders did. They, they said, oh, okay, well, if the priests need to wash their hands before going into the temple, uh, just, you know, to be clean, then maybe we should do it. Maybe we should do it too, just to be safe. And so let's just make this a rule. It's not just the priests, everyone. Everyone has to wash their hands. In fact, more than just washing your hands, let's, let's be extra safe. Let's actually clean all the cups, all the plates, all the, uh, all the copper things. Let's even uh, clean our, our dining sofa or our dining table. Let's clean everything. And if, if actually, if you don't do this, you're sinning. You're going against what God truly wants. And so they're taking scripture, but they're doing something weird with it. They're taking God's word and they're, they're, they're kind of adding, they're, they're, they're uh, twisting it around, and they're doing something different. The elders, they have, they have this tradition that they've passed down to clean, not just for the priest to wash their hands, but for everyone to wash their hands and clean everything. And so now the religious leaders are looking at the disciples and saying, hey, um, did you guys wash your hands? No? Oh, well, Jesus, why aren't, you, why aren't your disciples doing this? Don't you know that their hands are defiled? Don't you know that what they're doing is wrong? This is, this is sinful, essentially. And how does Jesus respond? What does Jesus say to the religious leaders? Continue with me. Mark chapter 7, verses 6 through 13, it says, And he said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things you do. All right, Jesus, Jesus goes off on them, essentially. And so the religious leaders go to Jesus and say, why are your disciples doing this? This is wrong. They should have washed their hands. And then Jesus, just right away, he's, he's ready to throw down. And he's like, oh, didn't, didn't Isaiah talk about you? Uh, he was talking about hypocrites. Yeah, that's, that's who you are. And then he says, this is what is written. Uh, he says, uh, this is what's written. When he says that, what, what he's actually pushing back, and he, he keeps kind of um, talking about these two concepts. He says, oh, you care so much about the, the tradition of the elders. You care so much about what these old people from a long time ago, what their opinions, what their preferences are. You care so much about what these people think. What does Jesus say? He says, you guys are hypocrites. He says, this is what I care about. He says, as it is written, God's word. I don't care about traditions. I don't care about what the, those other people think and, and what they've added. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come from the position of God's word. What do the commandments of God say? W what is that? And Jesus says, see, you, you've twisted this. You, you've made it about something else. You, you, you've, you've made it about tradition. And so when you worship and sing, you, you don't even care about God. When you're trying to do these things, you're trying to say the right things, but your hearts are far away. He says, no, 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 you've missed the whole thing. You've left the word of God and you're holding on to traditions, man's traditions. And Jesus brings up this really obscure example. Uh, and, and so stay with me and then we're going to get to what, what the point is, okay? Jesus' example is this. He says, okay, this is, this is, this is how I know that you've left God's word and held on to just man's tradition. He says, okay, so um, what's the fifth commandment? Honor your mother and father. Okay, good. Uh, so how do you do that? And for a lot of them, they came up with this tradition, this concept called Corbin. 
Okay, korban is, um, it, it's a spiritual term. It actually means I'm going to give this to God. I'm going to dedicate this to God. And so you can make anything you want korban. Okay, so, so let me give you an example. So you can go around your, your room. Just I know some of you guys are at home. All of you are at home or, or wherever you are watching this. Just look around uh, to see what you have. Um, people could be like, oh, you know what? Um, I'm going to be spiritual. And so this is my phone. My phone is Corbin. This is my watch. My watch is Corbin. Th- these are my clothes. My clothes are Corbin. That means my phone is dedicated to God. My watch is God's. My clothes, it's all God's. And it sounds good, right? It sounds like pretty spiritual, but this is a real problem. Honor your mother and father. That means you're just supposed to take care of them when they're old, when they need help. And so what the religious leaders were doing back in this day, they're trying to act spiritual. They're like, everything I have, it's all Corbin. I'm, so, I'm, I'm like dedicating it to God. I'm giving it to God. And then when their parents show up and they're like, hey, we're old now. We need help. Can, can you give us some money? They'll go to their parents and say, hey, 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 we want to honor you, but I'm sorry, I can't help you. You know, I have all this stuff, but it's all Corbin. And the parents might ask, well, can you just sell it? Can you just sell your watch? Can you just sell your car? Can you just sell your house and help us out? And they would say, absolutely not. It's all Corbin. It's all dedicated to God. Do you see what, do you see what these religious leaders are doing here? They are twisting God's word to justify themselves. They're twisting his word to justify their lifestyle, their actions, their beliefs, their preferences. They're doing this. And this is the first way that religious leaders try to clean themselves up. They go to, this is, this is really sad, they go to God's word and they twist it, and they take things out of context, and they teach it so that they're redefining what sin is. They're redefining what God says, and they're ultimately justifying whatever they want, their agenda. And we do this in a few ways too. But let me be a little bit more specific. I hear a lot of Christians say things, to, especially today, like, God is love. God is love. It, it's it, First John, it's in there. It's absolutely true. God is love. But they'll use that to justify all kinds of romantic and sexual relationships and say, hey, well, God is love, right? So what's the big deal? It, it's all okay. This is something, I think this is another way that we try to cleanse ourselves. We're trying to convince ourselves, hey, it's not that bad. It's not bad. God is love, right? Isn't that a spiritual thing? Don't you believe in that? Or we'll say things like this. Well, God shows us grace. Well, there's grace. Oh, yeah, of, of course I'm going to sin. Of course I'm, I'm addicted to all these things. Of course I'm lazy. Of course I haven't been doing these things. But God shows grace, right? He's just going to forgive me. And so we're just taking a concept and we're twisting it and we're perverting it. This is... This is one way for us to feel cleaner about ourselves because we know the filth within, but we're saying, hey, but does it really mean that? Is it really saying that? Isn't, that, isn't there a verse somewhere that says something else? This is exactly what the religious leaders are doing. They're taking God's word, twisting it to redefine sin to justify themselves. This is the first way. The second way. The second way that people deal with being filthy, dirty, sinful. Uh, Continue with me. Uh, We're going to keep going. And Jesus is going to now not speak to the religious leaders, but to the the disciples. And uh, I actually really enjoy this passage. Uh, This is going to be our last chunk of scripture. Mark 7, 14 through 23, it says this. 14. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. 
but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And what he had entered the and when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Then he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. See, Jesus is now going to really get to the heart of the matter. And what he's saying here is, man, the disciples are... uh, they're so confused. Okay, and, and, and as we go on to this, we're going to see that Jesus is really going after the religious people. And I think we look at the disciples and, and the Pharisees and the religious leaders, and sometimes we're like, oh my gosh, these guys are so stupid. Like, they're so annoying. Why can't they just understand anything? Uh, but I think we're so annoyed by them because we are so similar to them, right? So Jesus is teaching. He's talking about, uh, well, th- he's, he's essentially standing up For his disciples, to the religious leaders, he's saying, hey, you think washing your hands will clean you? It doesn't do that. Jesus is really getting to the heart of the matter. And he starts saying things like, it's not what goes inside of you that makes you dirty, but it's what comes out of you. And he's talking about food. He says, when you eat food, uh, even if there's dirt on your hands, hypothetically, you eat it. He says, this is what happens. You eat it. It goes into your mouth. It goes into your stomach. And then comes out the other end, but guess what? It never gets to your heart. It never touches your heart. And he says, the heart is the root of the issue. And and as the disciples are listening, they're like, yeah, uh, that's right, Jesus, stand up for us. That's that's what I'm talking about. Um, And then after all the religious leaders leave, the disciples go up to Jesus and they're like, wait, Jesus, what you were saying to them? wait, what, what does that mean? We, we had no idea what you were talking about. And then Jesus is like, what? I, I, I thought you understood what I was saying. They're, they're like, no, we, we have no idea. And then he has to explain to them again. And he says, okay, okay. You didn't even understand what I was saying. This is what I mean. The, the outside, what you can see, the external, that's not what you ought to focus on. That's not what counts. That's not what makes you dirty or clean. That's not it. And this is a second way that religious leaders and religious people try to clean themselves up. This is what they do. They focus on the external. They focus on the outside. And so you'll always hear religious people or moral people saying things like what? Um, why don't you not hang out with that group of people? Yeah, they're not like a good crowd. Just stay away. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, th- that's a bad word. Please don't say that. Don't, don't be around that language, uh, th- those movies, those shows, that kind of music. Please, please don't, don't get near that stuff. Religious people are always teaching that. Why? Because they think if you go into an area or a group, if you're around that kind of thing, it might rub off on you. Do, do you see their perspective? External, outward focused. And they think that if you just clean up the outside stuff, then everything will be better. Okay, let, let's, let's shift lanes, okay, from the more religious side, because some of you are like, I barely go to church. I'm, I'm not even super religious, okay? This is how we think about, I would say, mostly everything. This, this is what we do. We feel like the way to really clean up is to focus on the external. Uh, so let's go this way. Uh, politically, I know like maybe one of you cares about politics, maybe, I, I don't know. But this is what we say and think all the time. If we only a- elect the right leader, if we only have the right political party in place, then what? Then things will be better. Now we're going to really clean house. Now we're going to really make progress if these things, if these people are, are, are right, are, are good. Or we'll look at bigger things. Like, uh, let's, let's say racism or uh, 
institutionalized uh, structures that are broken. And we'll look at things like that and say, hey, it's, it's the structure that's broken. And so even phrases like uh, defund the police, uh, things like this are, hey, we need to change the whole structure, the system, the, the entertainment, uh, the way Hollywood is run. We need to change these broken systems, these broken power dynamics. And if we fix the entire structure, not just the leader, but the whole system, then maybe things will get better. The problem is, all of this is external. All of this is structural. All of this is outside. Jesus is saying, you can choose the right president, the right political party. You can change the structure. You, you can revamp, reallocate, do whatever you want. But at the end of the day, there's still going to be filth, corruption, sin, and problems. Why? Because the heart of the issue really is within. It's not the external things. It's what's inside, the heart. The heart is the problem. Out of the heart of man. Do you see the, the, this huge list at the end of uh, our section here in Mark 7? There's a huge list of sin. All of that what comes out of the heart of man, out of our hearts. And this is the problem. Nothing external will fix it. You can try to redefine your sin. You can try to twist scripture around. You can try to justify yourself. Yeah. You can focus on the external, clean up, do more good deeds, volunteer more, try to vote and do all these things. And of course, that'll help to a certain degree, but at the end of the day, how can we truly be cleansed? This is the question. What can actually cleanse us? What is our actual solution? And there's only one thing, only one way that this can happen. The way that this entire discussion started is the religious leaders went to Jesus to talk about his disciples eating fruit without washing their hands. And in verse 19, Jesus says something really important and really profound. It's actually a, a parenthetical remark, and, and it says this, thus he declared all foods clean. Jesus declared all foods clean. When Mark wrote this, you know, he, he could have said a lot of different things. He could have said, um, Jesus said that actually all food is clean, but he doesn't write that. Mark wrote, Jesus declared all foods clean. And, and that makes a huge difference. Jesus isn't changing the meaning. He, he isn't looking at the Old Testament and saying, hey, I'm going to actually say that that's wrong, even though that we, we shouldn't eat certain foods, we should be kosher. Jesus isn't saying that. What Jesus is saying here, again, is a d divine statement. Jesus is saying, I know some foods are unclean, but I, I declare all foods are clean. All food is clean now. Jesus is not abolishing the commandments and the law. He said this, I've not come to abolish it. I've come to fulfill it. I've come, I've come to make up for it. And how does he do that? How are we actually clean? Well, this is the process, okay? Stay with me as I, as I wrap up here, okay? This is the process. This is how people were cleansed. Mark is in the New Testament, and I think a lot of us forget this, but the Gospels, even though they're in the New Testament, they're written with the backdrop of the Old Testament, right? And so as Jesus is growing up, he's not growing up in this entirely new culture and, and environment per se. He's growing up in the Old Testament uh, traditions and, and, and laws and, and rituals. He's growing up with this backdrop. And the way that Jesus and all the disciples, all the Pharisees, all the religious leaders, the only understanding of them for being clean and pure is this. They're thinking about one place, one person, and one time. They're thinking about this one area, this one place. Okay, the temple would be, uh, th there's outer court, there's the inner court, and there's the Holy of Holies. Just, they're thinking about that one place with one person. Out of all the priests, there's the high priest, 
who is supposed to only go in there on one day of the week, the Day of Atonement, Yom, Yom Kippur. And, and that's what it's supposed to look like. And as they do this, the, the high priest is supposed to make sacrifice for himself, all the rest of the priests, and then all of the people. This is the only way that they're declared clean. And so the priest, you, you know how, what he would do, and, and a lot of us, we talk about that day of atonement. Okay, he has to go there and sacrifice and do this stuff. Yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty crazy, all right? But you know the week before, you know what he has to do? He actually has to leave his friends and family, the, the high priest, and he goes in quarantines, essentially. He goes into this special place that's been sanitized and cleansed, and the entire community is helping this priest. Do you know why? Because they're thinking, he's going to make sacrifice for us. If he messes up, we're not clean. So they're watching him, and they're supporting him. They're cheering him on. People are reading Old Testament scripture to him. People are helping. They're, they're serving him. They're, they're trying to pray for him. They're, they're encouraging him all throughout. They're, they're meticulously even watching him. You know that uh, when he even, he, when he bathes, he actually has to bathe in public, okay? There's this thin sheet that, that covers him, and, and there's just people watching to make sure he scrubs every part of his body. It's so weird, but this is what happens because this is so serious. It's almost like a surgeon going into an operation room. And so this high priest has to be perfect, perfectly clean the, the week before. Then he puts on all these robes, all these special garments to prepare to go in to the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement to make sacrifice, to clean and cleanse everyone. This is what he has to do. And even though he spent that week, even though he's perfectly clean and puts on all these perfect things, they even tie a rope around his waist because they're thinking, okay, even, even though he's putting his best foot forward, God's holiness can still kill him on the spot. And then we'll, we'll just have to drag him out. This is how serious it is. But Jesus is saying, it's okay for my disciples to, to eat. They, they didn't wash their hands, that's okay. Why? why? Why is he going through this huge debate and argument with the religious leaders? And he doesn't bring up the priest at all, does he? Does he say, oh, well, it's, they've sinned, but it, the, the, there's going to be a priest on, on the Day of Atonement. He'll do it. No, does he say any of that? Not at all. What does he say? He says, I, I'm, I declare that all food is clean. What Jesus is saying is, I'm the high priest. I'm going to make them clean. I'm going to make all of you clean. This is what I'm going to do. Jesus, the high priest, lived essentially the reverse of everything that they've understood and known. The high priest, he's a sinner himself, but he tries to put on the best garments when he faces God. Jesus, inside, he's actually perfect and spotless and blameless. And you know what he wore on the day of atonement for us, he was stripped, he was beaten. The, the, the crowds didn't come around to support him. They came to chant, crucify him, let's kill him. They ripped his garments off, they, they beat him. And on the cross, what Jesus did for us is he died for our sins, not just as the priest, but our sacrifice. That's what Jesus does for us. Jesus is saying here, I know you feel insecure. I know you feel the weight of guilt. I know you feel the shame in your life. I know there's all this sin in your heart. There's all this addiction. There's all these problems. All of this is inside you. And you can try to take scripture and justify yourself. You can try to redefine sin. You can try to clean up everything you can on the outside, but at the end of the day, we know that we're sinful. And Jesus is saying, I will make you clean. Just like I make all the foods clean, I will make you clean as well. There is only one way for us to be cleansed. It's Jesus, it's grace, it's the gospel. Not anything we can do, but our faith in his perfection. 
And so three rapid fire practical things and we'll wrap up. So let's get practical. What can we do? Three quick things. Number one, know the word. Do not twist scripture to justify your agenda, to justify your sin. You need to know scripture properly to not fall into what other people are saying, what other people's opinions are, what they think. You need to know scripture for yourself. Get into the word. Number two, when you're feeling this, this guilt, when you know you've sinned and messed up, instead of volunteering for Feed Brea, instead of volunteering at Catapult to make up for it, don't do that. that. That's not how you cleanse yourself. You cleanse yourself by confession. Confess your sins. Confess. And lastly, preach the gospel to yourself. When you're feeling insignificant, when you're feeling insecure, like, oh my gosh, I, I don't even know who I am anymore. Remind yourself of the gospel that Jesus, God's beloved perfect son, lived and fulfilled all the commandments perfectly on your behalf. That if you believe in him, God sees you perfectly, not because of anything you've done, but because he sees the great high priest, the final sacrifice, Jesus in perfection. So he loves you and delights in you the same. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this time that we can be reminded God, that nothing we can do can cleanse ourselves, but Jesus, it's you and you alone that does this. God, we repent of our sin. We do feel the weight of guilt and shame in our lives. So help us to remember Jesus and how much you love him, his perfection. God, and remind us that's how you see us too. We thank you so much. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, at this time, we're going to respond with this song. Um, I encourage you to sing um, with me. Or if you feel like you just need this time to pray, to just speak with God about what we just heard, then I encourage you to do that as well. Oh 
takes your face oh god of jacob god let us be a generation that sees seeks your face oh god of jacob that seeks your face oh god of jacob seeks your face oh god of jacob thank you for that hannah um just a few announcements before we wrap up uh first we have our devos still we're going through the book of job it is a uh, super emo, and so uh, if you're feeling sad or you know someone who's sad, I don't know, read with us. Uh, we are going to be on uh, YouTube on Wednesday at 7 o'clock, and so uh, tune in if you can. Uh, Friday, we're continuing. Uh, we just had our junior high and high school game nights uh, this past two weeks. It was great seeing you guys in the patio just hanging out. Um, from the feedback, it seems like a lot of you enjoyed it. We're going to try to do some more of that moving forward. Uh, for those of you who are staying online, and, and maybe it's hard for you to come out, uh, maybe for the foreseeable future, we're also trying to brainstorm uh, some things we can do online to hang out with you too. And so uh, we're, we're trying to think of you also uh, as well. But this coming Friday, we're starting a new series. Uh, so please come out with your friends, uh, tell, your, tell them to, to come visit. Uh, but we're going to restart this Friday uh, in a new series uh, for five weeks. Um, and so come out for that. Uh, really excited for that. Uh, and lastly, we have a s uh, another outdoor service next Sunday if you haven't been able to join us. Uh, but if you're thinking about, um, hey, maybe I do want to come out and see what our outdoor youth service is like, sign up online. Uh, we'll be there uh, waiting for you guys uh, to worship with you. Uh, and lastly, I think our ministry applications, if you haven't filled it out yet uh, and you want to serve with us this year, I think we have like 20 students who signed up so far. Uh, go ahead and do that by this Friday. I think that's when the deadline is. Um, we would love your help this year too, all right? Uh, let me pray for us to close us, and then uh, we'll wrap up our service. God, we thank you so much uh, just for your word. God, help us to, to be in it. Help us to preserve uh, your truth in it so we can live it out in our lives. Jesus, we thank you for the grace you show us. That when we fall, when we stumble, uh, when we fail, and we do often, God, help us to run back to you for grace constantly, over and over, God, and allow that to change us. We thank you so much, God, for your kindness. Be with us this week. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Love you guys.